I can definitely relate to bad handwriting. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Dr. Conlet, this question is for you. Um, in your written testimony, you talked about our country's enormous geologic and terrestrial reservoirs for carbon dioxide sequestration, your words. Um, so I uh, want to give you a little background uh, before I ask my question. So the congressional district that I serve sits on top of the Mount Simon Sandstone Basin. Um, you might know that as one of the best geological formations for carbon storage in the entire nation. And on top of that, uh, we have seven, seven biofuel refineries in and around the congressional district that I serve. Um, an ethanol refinery in my district called Pacific Ethanol, located in Pekin, Illinois, wants to capture carbon. Um, and they know that deploying this technology would be good for jobs, good for the economy, good for the environment. And they know they can do it cheaply, uh, maybe less than $25 a ton. And, um, you know, so we, we know also that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that there is a need for carbon capture and even say that it should be a hundredfold scale up uh, in order to meet our 2050 decarbonization goals. So, um, but the, right now there's only 26 operational carbon capture and storage facilities across the entire world. Uh, 12 of them are in our own country. Um, one more bit of background and then to my question. So the Energy Act um, enacted at the end of last year authorizes Congress to spend almost $7 billion over the next five years for, for carbon capture use and storage programs at the Department of Energy and EPA, which is more than three times the authorization limits in previous years. So Dr. Cunliffe, um, what I wanna ask you is how can we on this committee, appropriators, um, leverage those innovation funds to get more carbon capture jobs in places like the district I serve um, and get businesses like the one I mentioned um, to have the technology that they need to make this happen. Um, so Congresswoman, thank you for the question. And um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Ethanol facilities are an excellent near-term opportunity for carbon capture in part because they produce a near pure stream of CO2 so you don't have to, with, with ordinary power plants, you have to separate the CO2 from the fuel gas, and that's very energy intensive, but with ethanol, it's almost 99, almost 100%. So it's um, very cheap to capture. It's some of the lowest cost opportunity and the first place that, that um, we should start. And we, and we know how to do it. As you mentioned, it's already being done um, in parts of the US. Um, there still is some cost associated with transporting it and then storing it underground. And one thing that I think is underexplored at, at the, the Department of Energy and requires more investment is focus on um, uh, mapping underground reservoirs and characterizing them and understanding the um, available capacity and injection rates. We know we have a lot already from, from um, the US Geological Survey, but we need to really characterize it in much more granular detail and um, that's just a hurdle that individual companies can't always overcome on their own. Um, and, and then I would say just as it's deployed more and more, costs can come down so that other companies that have slightly higher capture costs can continue to build on that infrastructure. Um, my next question is for uh, Ms. Millikan. Uh, you highlighted the importance of direct air capture and the impact it can have on achieving our long-term term, uh, decarbonization goals. Um, scientists, scientists have been very clear about the benefits of direct air capture, uh, sucking CO2 out of the air and burying it underground in places like the place I just mentioned, the Mount Simon Sandstone Basin in Illinois. Um, so we, we also know that we need to be removing $500 million or 500 million or more tons of carbon dioxide per year by 2050. And right now uh, we're not even removing 1 million tons per year. Um, so my, my question is, what research design and demonstration steps does this subcommittee need to take to get direct air capture to the point where we're capturing 500 million tons per year? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, direct air capture is definitely one of the technologies that we think is going to be very critical in the future. Uh, fortunately, it is invented, right? And there are some very small scale 
uh, pilot projects that are happening right now, one of which um, Rich Powell mentioned earlier, uh, but it's nowhere near the scale we need it to be. It's also still very expensive. Um, so it's not going to be widely widely deployed until we can bring costs down. Uh, I think there are a lot of different things that could help in the bringing costs down category, certainly more um, you know, research and development into uh, you know, things that I mentioned earlier, like metal organic frameworks, you know, how we can um, uh, you know, sort of reduce the individual components of the system or reduce costs for those individual components, rather. Uh, we also need to do more demonstration projects. Um, there are some other uh, efforts at the Department of Energy um, that are mentioned in the Energizing America report that Dr. Cunliff co-authored that um, speak to the subject as well. So I'd encourage you to um, take a look at that as you all think about FY22 funding there. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Busto.